Today we're gonna to be talking about DeFi or decentralized finance. I'm here with Michael Llewellyn, uh, Texas Blockchain Council board member and DeFi expert, uh, smart contract expert, code auditor. I could, I could go on his titles and his resume is, is very extensive. So uh, Michael, why don't you start out by telling the audience a little bit about uh, what DeFi is, why is it called decentralized finance, and what are people doing with it right now? Sure thing. So uh, DeFi, of course, stands for decentralized finance. And the idea is that we want to create financial applications that people can trust um, in a sort of a system rather than any institution or group. So like, you might have to understand it better by looking at centralized finance, for example, a bank. Um, if you have an account with Bank of America or Wells Fargo or any other uh, institution like that, you're, you're kind of trusting a single company. They've got a board of directors, they've got a CEO, they've got stockholders. Um, but ultimately, like your access to money in that bank is very much dependent on uh, them giving you access. And something that a lot of people don't know is that a bank doesn't have any requirement to give you access to their services. Uh, if a bank doesn't like you, um, if they think you're doing something weird, if they don't fully understand it, uh, for example, if you work in the cryptocurrency industry, this comes up a lot, uh, they decide to not do business with you. In fact, they can send you a letter and say, we choose not to do business with you, we don't need to give you a reason, um, good luck. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a problem for certain parts of the community. Um, and you know, people in the US sometimes run into this like immigrants or people working in the marijuana industry in legal states. But if you go to other countries, like third world countries, it's actually far worse. Their, their banking institutions are much more primitive, it's much more restricted. And so the idea is if you can break it down so that there's not a centralized entity saying who gets access to banking services or who gets to use these, um, who basically gets the ability to transact online, you can actually open it up to a wider community. So the idea of decentralized finance is let's take the ability to access financial services out of the control of one person or one group of people and let's open it up just like the internet is opened up to anyone who wants to use it. So basically turn it from a a kind of a, a company or a service into a technology that everyone can use. Okay, so what about Ethereum? What percentage of DeFi activity do you think takes place on Ethereum versus other blockchains? And um, in that ecosystem, why why are the developing why why is the developer community so uh, enthusiastic about building DeFi applications? What are some of the top ones that come to mind that? Um, you know, people are using to, to do swaps and to uh, earn yield. All right, so yeah, we'll dive right in. Let's talk about what yields and swaps are too, like maybe define those terms for the audience as well. Gotcha, so, so I'll start with like, yeah, so a swap is the idea that if I want to trade, let's say I have some Bitcoin and you have some Ethereum as like two different cryptocurrencies and I want to trade with you, normally I would have to go to an exchange that's run by a company. Like I would go to Coinbase or Binance uh, and they would ultimately be a third party involved in that transaction. They would take a cut, that sort of thing. But that is kind of against the uh, spirit of crypto if the whole idea is we don't want third parties. And so what a swap does is it basically builds on top of a blockchain to say, as soon if you want to sell me this 10 Bitcoin and you want to sell me this 100 Ethereum, it will swap immediately um, and give us our transaction, basically switch these assets between our accounts in one transaction with the idea being, I don't have to trust you, you don't have to trust me, and there's no third party here making sure it goes well, we let the technology take care of it. Okay. And so uh, in addition to swaps, people being able to swap and essentially do decentralized exchanges, uh, we can also generate yield by creating lending products or ways to lend liquidity out to the market. And the idea is I can earn the same interest I earn on a bond, except in a decentralized way, where I get you know 5% on this crypto a year if I lock it up in a lending protocol and lend it to other people. Mm -hmm. um, let's think about that. So bonds right now are yielding, you know, one to two percent in some European countries, even negative. You have negative yielding bonds like in yeah. places like Germany, uh, which uh, with inflation where it is and where it's currently, in, you know, in the European Union at around three percent, in the UK around three percent, in the United States uh, slightly uh, more actually than that the last few months. Uh, you're actually losing money when you have your money in bonds or when you're holding it in a, in a bank account. Uh, you're, you're losing purchasing power, yes. if you will. So what, how important is it when you're using a DeFi product, if you, if you lock, so explain locking it up. When you say you're locking up you know, your Ether or Compound or whatever mm -hmm. um, you know, token you're locking up, 
you're, you're making yield on it. Why is it important that, how are these protocols able to offer higher yields than bonds? And why is it important for people to earn those, those yields when inflation is doing what it's doing? Gotcha. So I really, I think the, the short answer is because there's an open market for it. And uh, interest rates in Europe and the US and most developed worlds are determined typically in a top-down structure. There's a central bank that determines what the lending rate is for, um, you know, in the, our case, US treasuries or whatever the kind of sovereign debt is. And then it kind of trickles down um, from there to determine what everyone else's lending rate is. Um, but in crypto, there's You're no about one. The, the bank rate, the Fed rate, yeah. and then the you know banks set slightly higher rates so they can borrow from the Fed and then make a little bit off that. That's kind of what you're talking about. Exactly. So basically, the lending rate that we all experience, whether we're borrowing or we're lending, is determined by 12 people at the Federal Reserve um, or, or potentially less. And so what you get in a crypto market is no one's determining that rate. It's entirely open. And so if there's a higher demand for borrowing Ethereum, like let's say I want to borrow it to go spend on something, um, and I decide to lock it up, you know, other, let's say you want to lend me that Ethereum, um, that's an open market. And so anyone is able to provide that liquidity. And instead of going through, like again, a centralized party, like a bank that might help issue bonds for a company, like you know, usually only very large companies can uh, borrow or lend money. Um, in the case of crypto, anyone can do it. Like if you only have $5, you could put that into a, uh, a smart contract on Ethereum and earn interest on that alone as part of a, a larger pool. So yeah. it's very similar to like an ETF okay. um, where anyone can put a small slice in and get a, a piece of what could be a very large pie, except now it's not just holding some assets, it's actually being able to lend out to people or borrow from people and create even more complex things from that if you start to get creative. Okay. So let's just say somebody's never been involved in blockchain or crypto and they're wanting to take advantage of some yields on DeFi and they open up a Coinbase account, they fund it, they purchase some Ether or they purchase some, um, you know, you can purchase hundreds of coins on, on Coinbase, right? So there's any number of things they could purchase. Let's just use Ether as an example. And uh, then they open up like a MetaMask and they're wanting to go to Compound or one of these like uh, or Uniswap, or one of these protocols, what would what would they be doing? Describe what they would be doing and how that works on the back end. Not necessarily the like the the blockchain blockchain aspect of it, but um, describe like that process for us. Gotcha. So first of all, this isn't financial advice, of course. Um, so do your own research. But basically, the mechanism in play is first of all, you have Coinbase, which is a centralized um, exchange. They have cryptocurrency that they have locked up in wallets they control on your behalf. And you basically go to Coinbase and say, I would like to withdraw this into an account I control, which would be MetaMask, where you have the private key on your own device um, and you're ultimately responsible for it. Um, from there, what you're basically going to do is you're going to go to the Ethereum blockchain and you're going to seek out specific smart contracts, such as the smart contracts for Uniswap or Aave or Compound. And you're essentially going, and typically what people will do is they'll actually look at the lending rates across them. Some of them will have higher or lower interest rates, um, but some of them also carry more risk. Um, maybe if the market price goes down, you have a higher chance of uh, your money being uh, liquidated or it goes down in value faster. Like typical, f more gain, more risk is typically the, the thing you'll see in crypto. But um, let's say those are gains that you want and the risk is worth it. Um, you can basically deposit it in any smart contract, and typically what a smart contract will do is it will accrue fees from anyone using, let's say you put it in a contract that's going to lend money out, and it lends that to anyone who wants it, and then they pay it back with interest. You'll get a, a piece of that interest proportional to how much you put in. Yeah. And so it's kind of like saying- So break that down. So yeah. say there's a smart contract, we'll just use round numbers to make it easy, because obviously these numbers are not round. They're massive amounts of liquidity going to these contracts. But let's say there was only 100 ETH going into a contract, mm -hmm. and uh, one of those ETH was yours. Yes. You're saying you would get 1% of the fees accrued to that uh, contract. Exactly. And it would automate the smart contract. Let's define smart contracts for the audience. Ah, yes. So a smart contract is uh, basically kind of an autonomous agreement, or really in simple terms, it's a piece of code or a machine that can perform an arrangement without any third party. So like, for example, if we were going to do a lending arrangement in typical terms, in a traditional finance way, we'd actually sign a contract on the dotted line. Right. I say, hey, if you, if you lend me these uh, 10 Bitcoin, I'll pay you back in a year. Uh, and if not, you can take this paper contract and you can go to court. 
So in every contract um, with a piece of paper in typical like you know uh, in typical markets, the state or the um, you know the authorities are typically the third party guaranteeing that contract. They're right? enforcing your property rights against me if I default. Exactly, and so and we can take that. You know, one of us can take that to a court, and they'll define who was right, who was wrong, and then from there, um, you know, it would be resolved in whatever case. You know, the, the the police would show up and say you have to give that Bitcoin back, or etc. Whereas with a smart contract, there's actually no, um, or at least there's no expectation that the government will come in and enforce this. There's no expectation of going to court necessarily. Instead, we're going to rely on the technology, in this case, a blockchain, um, to enforce it. Exactly, a code that is written explicitly as if you don't receive this in 10 days, then it gets returned to his account. Um, and typically it's written so that there's always going to be a scenario where it's resolved uh, fairly. And we don't need to bring in a third party like a, a court system or a police force Arbitration or anything like that. or anything, yeah. yeah. So it's an if then, right? Exactly, yeah. It, there's a lot of predetermined steps. And, and the reason we might like that is, you know, in, in some cases, maybe you don't want to rely on the government. But most importantly, like if we are doing a, a, a $100 transaction, say, uh, which is like something that would be very accessible to the majority of Americans versus like $100,000 that maybe yeah. most bond arrangements that actually go to court would be for. You know, it doesn't make sense for a lawyer to take up a case for $100. That's going to eat up in legal fees before it even like shows up on the docket. Um, but if we're relying on the code to enforce it at a very cheap rate, then it does become uh, you know, feasible. So really, smart contracts let you do smaller scale lending and market arrangements that wouldn't be possible before because you wouldn't expect the court system to actually be able to handle those cases. Right, They're, the economics change when you increase efficiency like that, is yes. what you're saying. So when you're increasing this efficiency, what does that look like for um, the communities that have been underbanked or unbanked, where banks haven't, the economics haven't made sense for them to you know, lend to uh, folks in that um, you know, unbanked environment? How does, how does DeFi potentially uh, assist in democratizing finance? So I would say it just creates a very unopinionated gateway for people to get access to liquidity. And I would say the biggest barrier isn't currently um, you know, whether you have enough money or you have a good credit score. It's really, can you understand the technology enough to use it? And, and we're trying to improve the technology more and more so it's more accessible. Yeah. Um, but, but the chief idea is that if you, you know, want to borrow some money, and let's say you have some Bitcoin and you want to hold that Bitcoin as a, as a valuable asset, but you do want to, let's say, put an extension on your house. You could lock up that Bitcoin in a smart contract uh, and then be lent some sort of a dollar equivalent, some sort of stable coin, and then use those dollars to pay for your extension. And then in two years, let's say you decide to pay it back because Bitcoin's gone up, you want to get your Bitcoin back. Um, you can do that arrangement with the smart contract and get it back, pay a small fee, and then you're good to go. And the idea is if you, for some reason, defaulted, the smart contract keeps your Bitcoin. It's the collateral. Exactly. And the reason why someone wouldn't want to sell their Bitcoin and use it to you know, build on their house or remodel or something like that is because they would be triggering a capital gains event when they sold. Is that right? That's one scenario in which you would want to avoid selling it. Other cases would be you simply believe the value would go up over time. Okay. So you've got two significant scenarios. One is you're, you're saving on a capital gains event, and the other is you want to hold on to that underlying asset. Just like uh, the 1%, they don't sell their assets, they borrow against them. Yes. So this brings that whole mentality that was available just to the 1% to anybody. Yes, that's a great way of looking at it. Right now, borrowing against collateral, the closest thing you can get is a mortgage on your house. And that's- Not everybody can afford a mortgage. Yeah, not everyone can afford a mortgage. And even then you're putting you know, your, your home on the line to borrow money. Typically no one else has, you can't borrow a lot of money through any other scenario, but with cryptocurrency, you can. Um, and in, in many ways, you can also earn interest if you want. So you can do the reverse. I can lend you Bitcoin um, and earn additional interest on top of it. And so there's a lot of opportunities now for me to say, and even stable coins, to say I, I don't want to care about what Bitcoin is doing or what the price is going to be in a year. I want dollars, but I don't want a bond that's just going to sit there at like a measly 2% or less interest rate. I want 5 or 6% or at least something that you know, isn't super risky, but I, I feel like I'm outpacing inflation. That's another thing that's now available in, in many of these protocols where you have far better lending rates. 
you and I talk about stable coins and, and this kind of thing all the time. Let's just define it for the audience real quick. Absolutely. So a stable coin is effectively a, it's kind of like a cryptocurrency, except it's trying to mimic the value of something stable, in most cases, the US dollar. So the majority of stable coins out there are just a version of the dollar. And in many ways, it works just like dollars in your bank account would. It just moves from account to account. The only difference is that there's no third party um, confirming those transactions. It's all on a blockchain. It's similar to the gold standard, right? The gold, you know, you used to be able to convert a US dollar for uh, a sixteenth of an ounce of gold or something like yes. that. That was back, um, you know, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, we, of course, we don't, we're not on the gold standard anymore. So stable coins, you're, think, you could think of it as you're giving a dollar, someone's giving you a stable coin, and they're holding on to that dollar um, in some sort of uh, high, you know, or, or low, low, low risk environment where maybe they put that dollar into a bond or, or maybe they actually hold the dollar in a bank account. Yeah. And then whenever you want that dollar back, you give them the stable coin back and they give you the dollar. So um, if, I, if I miss some of that description, that's probably the, the way that I, that's the way I think about it. But how do you think about like that transaction, like a USDC or a Tether? Those are the two most prominent, highest market cap stable coins that I'm aware of. I think Tether's still higher than USDC, but, um, and then we could talk a little bit well, for another episode, we'll save for the conversation about the difference between Tether and USDC and how much of Tether's reserves are actual dollar reserves versus USDC's. But it, so, so circle, let's go USDC, I'm, I'm, I'm giving $100, $100 to be converted to 100 stable coins. Tell me, tell me kind of how that process works. So it's usually very simple, and it's typically, it's very similar to making a deposit in a bank account in a way, except your deposit can move beyond that bank in a sense. So yeah. if I go to Coinbase, and Coinbase is a, is a big supporter of USDC, they're one of the main uh, providers of that liquidity, um, I can exchange dollars in my bank account for USDC, and I can take that USDC and I could go not only to other markets at Coinbase um, and trade for it, but I could go to smart contracts that um, you know, can't handle dollars because dollars are physical and typically rely on a third party in the digital world. Um, but in this case, they actually can operate just like a cryptocurrency. So you get these nice advantages. Um, so I take my $100 and I convert it to USDC, which is a stable coin, and then I bring that to a protocol, a smart contract, um, let's just say like BlockFi or Celsius or something like that. And um, I, now that's a little bit different. So let's, yeah. before I do that, let's distinguish for the audience a DeFi smart contract versus a interest-bearing account on something like BlockFi and Celsius. Good point. So that's a very much a difference between centralized finance and decentralized finance, and the two terms sometimes get confused when a centralized provider is providing some cryptocurrency product. So in the case of BlockFi, that's BlockFi, the company, providing you interest on that account. They're not using, they might use smart contracts to manage the money, but they are ultimately in control. Um, whereas if I wanted to get interest-bearing accounts on like Aave, which is like one of the top leaf, uh, DeFi lending products, I could actually get that interest in a decentralized way. And wh why are sometimes, why does the interest, now this is a, just a question that I have a personal curiosity here and the audience may as well. Why can you get sometimes slightly higher rates on like a Celsius or a BlockFi than you can in Aave, like with, with USDC? Because mm. I've, I've seen like 6% on USD or on uh, BlockFi or Celsius, but then over on like Aave or Compound, it's slightly less. So there's definitely a lot of factors in play. I think a lot of it has to do with the need to, how much collateral is necessary. So for example, um, Aave does not do fractional lending. In fact, they over collateralize yeah. their loans, which means that if I want to borrow $50 um, using my Bitcoin, uh, I might actually need $100 worth of Bitcoin to do that because the idea is we don't want the price of Bitcoin to fall to like 90 and then my, I actually have borrowed more than that Bitcoin is worth in collateral. So, um, so in that point, your incentive, like the borrower may just hold on to the dollars because the Bitcoin that they have holding in collateral is worth less than, you know, what they would need to pay back to get it back. Exactly. Sort of like the pawn shop. Yeah. yeah, whereas BlockFi is okay to do some fractional lending where they can say, well, okay, we're, we're okay um, with some price changes. We can float that as a company. Um, whereas a smart contract, it's, it's a, kind of an all or nothing. You always want to have a collateral guarantee in a smart contract. In fact, in most cases, uh, a lending smart contract will liquidate you if your asset falls below a certain amount, which basically says, you know, we're at the point where this value is almost lower than the amount we initially lended you. So we're actually gonna sell this asset and then you know, repay your loan. 
um, because we just want to close it out and make sure it's kind of like a margin call. We don't we want to make sure that um, you're good on your loan, and you know the smart can, can, a smart contract can't rely on the court system if you go bankrupt. So it's going to you know get ahead of that and just close out the position before there's a possibility. Mm. So if somebody's watching this and they have never you know done anything on DeFi or, or even heard of it until today. What are the things that you would say, here's a couple key points to remember about this ecosystem, uh, some things that they need to make sure that they're doing to protect themselves when they're you know, either borrowing or lending in a DeFi environment? What, what are those key points? So I'd say a key point is that these are very new products and they definitely have a lot of uh, risks involved. I would say while you can trust the smart contract will do what it was written to do, sometimes the way it was written can be flawed. And that's where uh, security audits become important. So being aware that if you're investing in a DeFi smart contract, you're going to hope that it has been audited, that it's gotten through some code review. Uh, and, and, that's it, what, and that's what yes. you do. Yes, that is what we do at Open Zeppelin. You at Open Zeppelin and your, your colleagues there are auditing smart contracts all the time. Absolutely, yeah. And we work with some of the biggest uh, programs in the space because there's now billions of dollars on the line. And so unlike cases with you know, a bank account, there's no, uh, you know, we're trusting the banks to manage the money appropriately, but we typically don't worry too much about them getting hacked. Um, but in our case, if it gets hacked, then the money can move somewhere else and it doesn't come back. So. There's no pulling back, like, an, like you can pull back an ACH, you can't pull back. Exactly. And then the second way that people will typically be hacked um, is their private key. So even if the smart contract is secure, um, your ownership of the you know, de assets you deposited are tied to that smart contract key, or rather, I'm sorry, that private key that's held in MetaMask or some other wallet. So protecting that is crucial, as well as backing it up. If you lose your computer, um, there's no way to recover it unless you have that private key backed up somewhere safe. Right. And that's, uh, that's the second biggest way we see people um, lose funds. They either lose, lose that key or it's stolen from them. So definitely, and in, in cases where you're doing a lot of money, potentially get a hardware wallet or something that can be held offline to reduce the chances of any of that happening. Mm -hmm. That's great points. So where can people go to learn more about you, Open Zeppelin, DeFi, all these things? Uh, absolutely. So for me, uh, definitely on... Uh, my website, michaelllewellen.com, which is really just a link to GitHub and Twitter and LinkedIn and places like that. Uh, and then for the company, definitely at openzeppelin.com. Uh, we do a lot of things in the space. Audits are one, but we actually have a big open source contract library that people use. So, for example, the tokens that, like, for example, USDC and Tether use on Ethereum are actually based on token contracts we've already created. Mm -hmm. Or at least I'm, I'm sure that USDC is. And so typically, you know, these contracts get rewritten over and over again, so we actually try to take some of the most commonly used smart contracts, write them in a really clear, simple, composable way, um, obviously do a security review, and then let anyone else use it without having to uh, rewrite it and potentially introduce bugs. So most DeFi projects out there use some form of our contracts in one way or another. Very good. Michael, it's been a fascinating conversation. I appreciate you coming on. Um, we're going to do more videos like this where Michael's going to delve deeper. This was kind of our first initial foray. Uh, so be on the lookout for those. Thanks for watching. Thank you.